All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, greetings from South Beach, uh, Miami, Florida, which is uh, not very sunny this morning. Hurricane season is uh, up on us, but uh, still a beautiful place. I hope everybody's having a great day at the, the COCX Festival 2021. I'm excited to share um, a, a little bit of uh, my vision and perspective on quantum computing, what the current state of our industry is and um, uh, what might be possible with this uh, spooky, as Einstein called it, technology. Uh, I look forward to answering as many questions uh, of yours as possible. So I'll be checking back into the chat uh, every few minutes uh, and, and uh, uh, would love to see any uh, questions. There are no dumb questions in quantum. Nobody really understands how this works. Uh, so please feel free to uh, share your thoughts, feedback, and questions. With that, we will get started. If uh, you allow me one second to share my slides. <clears throat> there we go. And uh, we'll start with just uh, a little bit of a quote that uh, I hope summarizes uh, my perspective uh, on the industry. Uh, Edward Stemming was a very famous process engineer that had a big hand in optimizing manufacturing processes uh, way before we even started to talk about uh, quantum computing, a field that uh, he, he unfortunately never got to see. But he said that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And the reason that for me, this is so important is because quantum computing and quantum technologies, what we call quantum information science, which is made up of uh, quantum computing, quantum communications, quantum sensing, and quantum key distribution, is such a young and technologically still immature field. Um, it is also a small family, and mo most of the time we get along. It uh, would probably be a, a, a happy uh, American Thanksgiving uh, table or, uh, or, or other get together if, uh, if uh, we ever had that opportunity again. Um, but obviously there's uh, a lot of hype, uh, a lot of media and a lot of press um, uh, uh, around uh, quantum computing. And uh, the way I view my job, especially as an investor, is uh, to understand where can we find or create data on the quantum computing space. So I'm talking about understanding the, the players, key stakeholders, uh, and, and so forth in quantum computing, turn that information eventually into knowledge for, for ourselves, but also our clients, um, in, in the hopes of uh, producing insights um, uh, or, or even wisdom that uh, leads to better decision making. Uh, my background, um, I studied economics at the University of Chicago, quantum computing at MIT. Uh, for the last three years, I've worked uh, exclusively in the field of quantum technologies with um, uh, three ventures, interference advisors. Uh, and that's where this little introduction comes from. Think of us as the Gartner or pitch book of uh, quantum computing. We've collected about 30,000 data points on who the startups the vendors, the investors, the use cases, the technology, and so forth uh, are. One Quantum, which is uh, the largest global quantum uh, technology uh, community organized in chapters. Uh, our largest chapter is the Women in Quantum chapter, uh, where we ourselves have a large conference, uh, July 19th and 20th, to help women in STEM and women in quantum um, uh, be successful in this field. Uh, but uh, a lot of regional chapters from Africa to the mountaintops of Nepal, um, Latin America, and uh, many other places. Entanglement Capital is my own little, uh, very small investment fund in the field, 100% dedicated to quantum technologies. Just quickly checking. I uh, always love the Demings quote. Uh, thank you, Samir. I uh, appreciate that. He was a very uh, wise men. So uh, I look forward to more questions and feedback. Um, uh, I will uh, stop by the chat again after we explore what is possible with uh, quantum computing. And uh, my uh, goal for the next few slides is not necessarily to be rooted in reality too much, but uh, to shoot for dreams bigger than the universe and uh, even beyond the stars. What is theoretically possible with quantum computing? And everything that I'm going to share in the next couple of minutes are things that we have the research, the theoretical understanding for, or even very early stage experiments 
at the you know very very small fractions of a second kind of level star trek um everything that we've seen in science fiction movies beam me up scotty this is firmly rooted in the physics of quantum mechanics uh something that we have theoretically very well understood and that some folks are working on experimentally be decades and decades before we're able to beam ourselves, uh, you know, maybe from a, a rainy London, also I hope it's not raining today, to sunny uh, Miami Beach, but theoretically this is uh, possible. <clears throat> Tony Stark, I hope you've all seen his movies. Uh, he built his success on uh, uh, coming up with new materials, new sources of energy, um, um, new vision technology that uh, allowed him to, you know, uh, implement his mission which was both commercial, but uh, also a little super heroic. Um, and this is exactly what we're currently on with quantum computing. Also, I'm not aware of anyone uh, building a, a Tony Stark suit, but uh, coming up with new compounds, new materials, new molecules um, uh, to, to build new materials and, and new chemicals um, is one of the most relevant and most near term applications of quantum computing. We just need a Tony Stark and uh, I'll be making that point a few more times uh, throughout the next half hour. Uh, back to the future, uh, you know, the beautiful DeLorean, you still see the, the tire and the time travel uh, traces here outside the uh, Midtown Theater. Uh, is something that is rooted in quantum physics as well. We have done this uh, at the you know, small elementary level for split seconds in the lab, again, decades, decades, if not more away from uh, doing this at any meaningful scale, but theoretically possible with quantum physics. More tangibly, and, and these are things that we're working on. You see this beautiful lake, um, snow-covered mountaintops in the back and, uh, and a green lush forest, climate change, uh, things like uh, carbon extraction, um, clean energy, clean water, very relevant <clears throat> and imminent applications of uh, quantum technologies and something that we all need to put a big focus on. Um, uh, th this gentleman, and unfortunately not myself too much, I haven't been to the beach in, in a few weeks, but he seems to be enjoying life and uh, watching his portfolio of uh, investments on his uh, tablet on, on the right side table. Uh, the, financial applications that potentially might create this universal wealth or basic universal income are things that um, not just labs, universities and startups, but many of the big banks from Barclays to BBVA, Goldman Sachs are currently experimenting with on existing quantum computers. Um, in the same vein of thought, uh, global healthcare and um, you know very uh, relevant in, in, in our days, unfortunately, uh, you know, personalized uh, medicine and, and, and really the creation of, of these new compounds that will offer us, you know, be it vaccinations, medications, or these personalized treatments is exactly what quantum computing is so ideally designed to, to do. Uh, not a city that I necessarily would want to live in. Maybe I need a better picture, but the smart city, the city of the future, with all of its uh, logistical channel challenges, uh, self-driving or self-flying cars, um, uh, unlimited energy, uh, seems to have uh, you know very clean air here. Uh, uh, these again are things that are made possible by quantum computing, and probably something uh, in the medium term that uh, that we can realistically attack. Um, some large automotive companies, for example are working on some of these uh, traveling salesman problems that uh, arise out of logistics, traffic routing, and so forth. Uh, so these are just some of the, you know, uh, hope for, hoping to make you dream kind of applications. Um, it is an amazingly sunny day in London. That, that is great to hear. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful city that I miss very much. Um, so hopefully this, um, you know, gives you a little bit of a sense of what is possible with quantum technologies. And I don't know anybody in the field that would argue that these things that I just mentioned aren't possible, but you know, 
what is their timeline and, and how do we get there? So where are we at in quantum computing? Uh, this is a little bit of the eye candy shard. Think of this as the quantum computing tech stack and really just the three things that you need to take away from this uh, at the bottom uh, layer uh, colored in blue is the quantum computing hardware. So a quantum ship on which you have these uh, qubits that create the state of superposition and entanglement um, uh, that allows us to de do these computations. Um, for, for those of you um, uh, not familiar with the concept of quantum computing, quantum computing is something that allows us to solve a certain set of mathematical problems, which, which we call you know, the, the, the P versus NP hard problems, mostly found in optimization problems, factorization problems, traveling salesman problems, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, which are so relevant in, in finance or, or, or chemistry, um, much better than a classical computer, a classical computer that gives us a binary response that you know, we are all familiar with, zero, one, a negative or positive charge uh, uh, in, inside the hard drive of our, our laptops uh, and even smartphones. And uh, a quantum ship, this qubit, which you know, imagine it as a sphere, like a kind of a ball, where these elements evolve in all kind of directions and have a state of superposition. So rather than giving us a computational output of zero or one, they give us a computational output where all of these results are in a state of superposition. And thus we're able to make certain mathematical calculations that today are out of reach, even for the most powerful supercomputers or can only be done by proxy things such as financial models, weather models, medical models, uh, which have their own constraints and limitations. So the blue classical layer, quantum ships, quantum uh, controls, quantum measurement uh, mechanics, uh, these are things that are very well understood uh, that we've been working on for you know, now over uh, 25, soon 30 years. Worldwide, there is roughly 100 quantum computers, physical machines, IBM has uh, about 20 of them. Google, um, um, companies like Intel are working on them. Many research universities, Stanford, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, ETH, Zurich, and so forth have, have these machines. Uh, they just have very limited capabilities. These qubits, these uh, you know, quantum equivalents of a classical bit where the calculation happens are still very small in number, around 72 is the highest publicly known number. And they're very figly. They're very sensitive to external noise, heat, vibrations, um, which doesn't allow us to work very well with them. They have what we call a very low coherence time, um, uh, which makes it difficult to execute circuits, calculations uh, on them. But that hardware exists. Um, it is at this point mostly an engineering challenge, which some people say we will overcome in the next three years, other you know, put the timeline at 10 years, uh, but uh, we feel uh, as an industry very confident that uh, the hardware problems are being solved and um, uh, worked on very professionally. Above that, you have <clears throat> a whole uh, instructional layer, and this is basically the quantum software. Uh, interestingly, there is a very large ecosystem of quantum software startups and vendors that are working on quantum languages, compilers, um, um, uh, libraries, and so forth. Um, and we've made tremendous progress here. Uh, obviously, now we really need to figure out how that software best works with uh, these different approaches to, to implementing the hardware. And uh, that's going to take a few, year, few more years of collaboration between the hardware and the software people. We'll uh, look at that in uh, a little more detail in, in a few slides. At the very top in red, you see quantum algorithms and quantum algorithms, that's the tough part. That is um, very, very, very smart uh, 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 girls and guys uh, thinking about how to represent these um, problems, challenges that we're hoping to solve quantum mathematically. So here we need to come up with entirely new algorithms and, and quantum math that describes how do we extract carbon from the atmosphere? How do we build a financial portfolio? 
um, so that we can then translate it into software and eventually execute it on the quantum hardware. And, and this is the field where the most progress um, still needs to be made. So let's uh, break this down a little bit and um, not, not getting technically here at all, but just so that you get a sense at the very left prime factor in big data Monte Carlo. These are some of the mathematical fields, these NP versus P hard problems that quantum computing is likely to solve where classical computers, the way that we use them every day, um, uh, struggle. And this gap, this delta is what we call speed up quantum speed up or the performance that a quantum computer might offer above the best and most um, uh, powerful known supercomputers. Uh, under industries, the middle section, uh, just a very rough mapping of uh, where some of these mathematical uh, fields apply in terms of potential verticals. And you see that uh, you know, finance, chemistry, uh, new materials, also, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning um, are fields that are the most likely to produce some of this quantum speed up. Um, we then, on the right side, area score, try to estimate how large these potential markets might be and uh, how uh, uh, powerful, how big a speed up they might deliver. And the more stars, the better, of course. Uh, you see that uh, this gets uh, messy fast. There are very few applications, if you start to think about the enterprise and, and real world users, that will at the same time have a large market or a large impact uh, while um, uh, being able to deliver a large quantum speed up as well. And this is where the industry is at. So we're working on, on exactly these kinds of problems and you know, different ways to slice and dice this slide but uh, trying to optimize the hardware, the software, and most importantly, the algorithms to really find niches uh, uh, in this type of diagram where quantum computers might be able to have an impact in the next two, three, five, or 10 years. Um, to give you a sense of what this ecosystem looks like, I mentioned a few names, IBM, Google, Intel, Microsoft, Amazon, um, um, uh, PayPal, and, and others are all building quantum computing hardware uh, or quantum computing simulators. Uh, and then there is a large ecosystem of startups, um, spin-outs um, uh, from these large universities where research uh, groups um, make licensing deals and IP deals with their university to then uh, commercialize them. Um, this field has grown over the last three to four years, but not as much as you think in terms of number of companies. Today, there is about 500 companies. You see that we also include um, these other fields of quantum information science, like sensing communications and quantum key distribution, which is encryption or anything related to hacking into these. These are much smaller than the two left bars, which is quantum uh, computing hardware and quantum computing software. Again, very interestingly here, you have um, almost as many software uh, providers in quantum computing as hardware providers, and we barely have hardware that is working. Um, uh, so a little bit of a crazy world, but uh, hopefully this will uh, help us to be successful. If you look at the geographical uh, distribution of these uh, uh, providers, no surprises here, they come out of the big universities and, and big research corporations, uh, North America, the US and, and Canada dominate here. Um, uh, Australia has a, a very strong ecosystem uh, and Europe is catching up very strongly. Um, uh, the UK has a, a fabulous um, national quantum strategy. Uh, Germany, especially over the last year, with many billion um, uh, euros and grants has kind of become a leader in the world. Uh, France is uh, truly stepping up and building its ecosystem as a Spain, um, uh, one of the largest global quantum computing hardware manufacturers sits in Finland, a startup called IQM. Uh, so Europe is starting to take a little bit of a leadership role if Europe can come together. The UK in itself, um, uh, by a number of startups, by a number of private investors, venture capital and so forth, um, not government grants, um, is the leader in that European context. Then, of course, we have China and Russia, 
um, where we know little about their programs. One thing that we know about China is that they um, invested a total of 11 billion USD into their national quantum program. Um, in the US, we are around uh, at around two to uh, three billion at this point. Um, in Europe, we're, you know, as an aggregate, probably exceeding the 10 billion uh, at this point. Um, uh, but this is uh, kind of the distribution globally. You see that uh, Latin America and uh, Africa um, uh, sadly are lagging behind. The total um, market, um, this is actually an older slide, let me uh, skip to the new side, is still very small. Companies, these, these 500 or so vendors out there, have research partnerships uh, uh, with corporations like JP Morgan Chase, BMW, um, uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies and so forth. That is a market that we estimate at about 300 million in terms of revenue for this year. And at the conservative but optimistic growth rate, we see an overall market of somewhere between 11 and 12 billion USD um, in 10 years from now. So in itself, a strongly growing market, a, a real market, but um, you know, this, uh, this is not uh, the next iPhone moment or, or, or Tesla in terms of market size. The real breakthrough here will come from actually applying and using this quantum technology and uh, revolutionizing or, or innovating entirely new uh, industries. Um, Seth, uh, the session is being recorded, absolutely. Uh, happy to share that. And uh, I'd be happy to share those slides uh, as well. I will share my uh, contact information at the very end. And uh, happy to answer any questions or share, share any assets. Um, one big problem that we have on quantum computing, uh, and this goes to this one quantum community organization that I started a little over a year ago, is that we looked at um, you know, 560 of these large startups, uh, vendors, but also other organization, research tanks, think tanks, and so forth, uh, identified 782 founders, CEOs, general managers, and so forth. Most of them are men and most of them are white. And uh, that is, uh, in my opinion, a huge uh, issue and concern when we're looking uh, at doing innovation, especially with a technology that is classified by all big governments as you know, a national security threat and a national um, uh, priority, uh, which it is in uh, DC, in Berlin, in Brussels, in London, in uh, Peking, and uh, many other of the large capitals, because it might have you know, military implications as well. So this is something that uh, we and a couple other organizations are working on. How do we bring more diversity and more people into quantum tech to really make sure uh, this is uh, being used for good and uh, uh, no bad reasons. Uh, I mentioned universities many times. This is a ranking that we did by uh, you know startup output of these large research organizations. No surprises here, the UK. Uh, is uh, actually leading with uh, Oxford, taking the number one spot, Cambridge at four. Uh, Toronto, Canada has an extremely strong ecosystem, which is uh, largely due to you know, their really strong research, but also a grant by uh, Michael Asardos, the founder of BlackBerry, who put 300, 350 million of his own personal money into quantum, uh, mostly around Waterloo, which you see at, uh, at number seven. Um, uh, and made a big personal bet on this technology. You also uh, noticed Hugh Delft, a, a, a very renowned Dutch university in the Netherlands has a very strong uh, program here. But you see this is the ivory tower, which is great, but how do we make it broader and um, diversify the access? I spend much of my time looking at deals, investments, or speaking to other investors um, to give you a sense of what investing in quantum information science looks like. Um, you see some of the numbers here, 2018, 2019, 2020, have been small and slowish kind of years. You see that growth in terms of private capital, I'm excluding government grants here, um, has, uh, has not been uh, breathtaking by uh, any means. And uh, you also see that most of the money is going into quantum computing and uh, in those three years, especially into hardware, much more than software, 
Uh, obviously, it uh, takes a lot more resources to build quantum computers. Some people say, you know, 50 to 100 million is kind of the barrier to entry here. You can now buy your own on-premise quantum computer from a couple of providers for somewhere around 15 million, probably. Uh, if you look at uh, the full year 2020 uh, KISS data, uh, you can check this out online. KISSdata.com uh, is one of our data services. Uh, in the entire year of 2020, private investors put just about 1 billion USD to work, which is a nice amount. I would love uh, to, to, to claim that as my own. Um, but in terms of investing into technologies, this is uh, still very timid, even more so if you eliminate two, deal, uh, two deals that um, you know, form a statistical tail end here and, and make up uh, half of, uh, of that valuation. You also notice the average deal size with just about 7 million, which in a tech and deep tech environment is truly not very much. We um, typically release a half year investment summary. So that's a couple of weeks out, but we quickly run some numbers to compare January 1st to May 31st of last year versus this year. Um, um, if you take the slightest bit of interest in quantum, you've seen a few big uh, announcement and wired TechCrunch Forbes over the last four or five weeks with large deals, especially SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies and, and vehicles being made. Um, but you know, what does this really mean? Um, uh, 2020, we counted 450, 445 million USD invested in private capital. Um, during the same period this year, uh, we count almost three times as much, 1.73 billion. But, and this is where it gets interesting, the total number of deals is way down, 17 versus 28. And again, we have these statistical tailings. And if you just take those out, uh, especially these three SPAC deals for 300, 350, and 400 million this year, uh, the totals of 2020, 230 million versus 2021, 223 million really hasn't, haven't moved very much. What does this mean? It means that average deal size has multiplied by a factor of uh, seven or eight here. Um, it means that a lot more follow on investments are happening. A lot more, more professional investors um, are, are doubling down on their bets, moving these growth companies in, into hopefully a scaling stage um, uh, and really starting to look at enterprise use cases. But we're not seeing new fresh money flowing into new ideas, new you know, teams and um, um, uh, really fueling the seed stage uh, efforts in any meaningful way. And this, in my opinion, is much overlooked in the industry and very important. Uh, just looking at the sources of capital geographically on the left side and where the capital, capital goes, it no surprise matches uh, the map we saw a few slides ago um, uh, European private investors uh, actually are a very, very significant source of capital. Um, uh, Europe, once again, has the big problem of attracting very little private capital. Uh, and that is very, very slow to change, unfortunately. Um, you're starting to see Israel pop up on this map. Um, Australia probably deserves a little bit of color at this point. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, places like Japan, even India are starting to see, uh, you know, the first uh, investors, uh, VC funds looking at this technology, as well as startups uh, attracting seed round A type of uh, growth uh, capital. Um, just a split by uh, different applications. The gist here is that quantum computing dominates and other technologies like communication sensing and QKD really lag behind. Um, but the maturity of these investors is increasing a lot. Um, see if there are any questions at this point, nothing so far. So let's uh, take a quick look at uh, what quantum computing is not. Uh, the reason that I think this is important is um, because quantum is spooky and, you know, for, forgive the word sexy, you see articles in the mainstream press uh, almost every week at this point. And there are just a lot of falsehoods and, and, and hype in them. So but in my opinion, it's very important to also understand what quantum computing and quantum technologies 
are not. And what it is not, um, and I feel very strongly about that, is a consumer technology. There are some yeah, small handful of vendors out there that are trying to put quantum computers onto the desktop, um, uh, how to make them available to every school, every, every research institute, every company globally, almost a consumer type of play. And the iPhone moment of quantum computing has become somewhat of a term recently in, in our industry. I just don't see that happening. We don't have um, the applications, the use cases for it. We don't have the product and technological maturity for it. We really just don't have a use for it. And, and it makes uh, no sense um, uh, for a consumer to be using a quantum computer at this point. If you nonetheless wanted to, and I encourage you to, because it's fascinating and kind of fun, there's a, a handful of cloud services, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, where most of them for free, you can sign up and actually execute a quantum circuit uh, in the cloud on, on a live quantum uh, computer that one of these provider offers. And uh, that is certainly a market that is growing and, and IBM especially is driving forward tremendously. Personally, I'm not even sure that quantum computing in the medium term, let's say the next five to 10 years, is going to be, going to be a big enterprise technology. For me, quantum computing is more this Tony Stark kind of moment. Um, certain banks that have task force many times in spells mode, um, some entrepreneurs that have an ambition to build this universal type of quantum computer, which we call up universal fault tolerant computer that is not sensitive to these external interferences um, to really create some of these breakthrough innovations. To me, that is more likely to happen over the next five to 10 years than us seeing a real integration of quantum computing into the enterprise tech stack, um, uh, which uh, in itself, just from an implementation point of view, would uh, take years. Um, certainly something that will happen at some point, but uh, in my opinion, not in the near future. Uh, Margie here, um, uh, uh, looking at her diet, I presume, and being very unhappy uh, because it is uh, you know, a very incremental plate of food. And um, something that we see a lot is uh, quantum computing vendors providing incremental um, uh, improvements to known problems. And while that is commendable and great, to, for example, improve the performance of electrical batteries in cars by 15-20%, uh, quantum computing is not an incremental technology. It is not something like artificial intelligence, potentially, that is supposed to make a process, a product, just a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. It is a, a breakthrough kind of technology. It is something that by its nature will either give you an answer that you didn't have before or it will not and then it is up to you to take that answer of a new climate model a new financial portfolio a new molecule a new compound and invent something new with it uh, but uh, I, I don't um, uh, see this as incremental technology i think that might be the death of quantum computing indeed and that is my personal opinion, even so I try to stick to data as much as possible. Uh, the current state versus a breakthrough, and uh, we'll wrap up here in the next uh, five minutes. Um, uh, this field really still is dominated by scientists, the smartest people you've ever met, extremely hardworking, extremely ambitious. Um, they, by their own nature, have, have their own limitations. And, and that's what this uh, little cartoon on the top left here is, uh, uh, is uh, hoping to demonstrate. Um, and it is difficult for many of these scientists to compete in a commercial world where we now have these investors, board of directors, national interests, international think tanks, and uh, just general enterprise commercial market dynamics being uh, exercised on, on our field. Uh, so something that we need and, and currently are lacking, and unless uh, she or he is, uh, is working in silence in some dark lab, is this uh, Tony Stark type of figure uh, that takes the current state of our technology, has the skill set, but also the resources to then come up with a breakthrough innovation for an existing industry 
or something even completely entirely new. It is time to make a switch from improving the science and, and, and the academic aspect into truly making this a product and a solution, a technology that will help humanity. Um, you've seen the trickle of money, and even so, there have been large announcements. Um, Honeywell, um, which is probably the leading quantum computing hardware manufacturer, just uh, announced a spin-out and merger with Cambridge Quantum Computing, one of the two or three largest quantum software providers in a very large deal. Um, the slide below is a, a, the SPAC announcement by IonQ, another uh, of the you know, very leading quantum computing hardware manufacturers. And these were large deals. Um, IonQ got a valuation of 2 billion for their SPAC, 650 million in capital, but still it's really only a trickle of capital. To be fair, governments are stepping up. Um, um, the UK will be announcing a new program uh, it, it, across Europe, we see more and more efforts. Uh, the U.S., as part of its uh, infrastructure bill, will be pouring large resources and capital into this. Um, but this, uh, this really needs to happen. Um, and we need to take this uh, technology seriously. We also, and this is related to uh, the slide that, that I started this section with, um, uh, really need to bring business and commercial best practices to it. And you know, uh, uh, Mr. Bean here, um, if, if you say SWOT uh, analysis, uh, looking at uh, markets or companies, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, um, uh, if, you, if you kind of say that one more time, you know, he gets, uh, gets excited. But it is these kinds of skill sets and, and um, uh, approaches and frameworks and best practices that we also need to start to apply to quantum computing. That is still lacking, and it is uh, especially lacking in the context of what does it mean for quantum computing, rather than just trying to apply it in a cookie cutter manner. And um, I, I use the word paradigm shift um, uh, uh, myself way too often, but we have to be careful about generating this hype and, and, and just really you know putting our heads down and uh, doing the work that is necessary. How do we close this gap? Uh, a, a British, uh, a fellow British uh, uh, leader here said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And you know, there was nothing good about what happened to all of us over the last year or so. And hopefully most of us are you know, uh, coming out of this uh, stronger and healthy. Um, uh, but quantum computing in itself is a huge opportunity to address some of humanity's biggest problems but also biggest opportunities. Uh, and we need to create this energy and, uh, and shock moment around it to move us all forward. This is my little introduction to quantum computing. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, um, I actually have one more slide here. You see my website and email address at the bottom right. I'd be happy to share the slides, the recording, answer any questions that you might have. And uh, if there are questions here in the chat, uh, Stephen, is programming now getting too complex as we get more power to solve integrating problems? Do we need machining, machines programming machines? Um, uh, yes, Stephen. Uh, you know, I think uh, my biggest worry is really about this red layer on the quantum tech stack, the quantum algorithms. And we still fundamentally have way too little structural understanding among all of these crazy use cases that I mentioned, all of these practical use cases that I mentioned, on how do we actually implement that? Not at a software layer, but logically, mathematically. Um, uh, and, and that is a function of the world being complex, not so much the hardware or the software, um, but we really just need to do a lot of theoretical work around that. On the software side, we now see the software um, uh, vendors um, merging, collaborating with the hardware vendors and, and hardware vendors buying software vendors. So we see a much tighter integration between those two. I don't think we need machines to program our machines uh, just yet. Um, uh, in that sense, quantum uh, computing is uh, fairly straightforward. It's based on a gate system uh, most of the time, a CMOS type of approach. Um, uh, but that is certainly something that will come 
ultimately. Uh, Shintan here uh, in the chat, uh, he uh, works uh, for us at One Quantum as the president of the One Quantum India chapter and um, kicking off a, a fantastic um, a workshop series uh, later this week. So anyone in India interested in quantum computing, please reach out to Shantan. Um, Stephen, uh, you asking, indeed, we now need resource optimization models iterating with infrastructure uh, simulation. Um, uh, absolutely. And we need, um, you know, enterprise and, and, and uh, financial thinking um, at, at the same table um, so that this doesn't become a ghost or fantasy, but something with real world uh, applications. And um, that is, in my opinion, where we're at in terms of this uh, maturity curve, um, the slope of enlightenment. Good. If there are no more questions, I uh, thank you all. Uh, again, feel free to reach out if, uh, if you do have um, uh, uh, any more thoughts, feedback, or questions. Always happy to chat about quantum technologies. We haven't looked at sensing communications or quantum key development yet. Um, sensing is a technology that finds its uh, application mostly in the military complex, but also uh, things like mining and chemicals where these properties of uh, uh, quantum physics allow for much finer uh, sensitivities in their sensing as well as uh, self-contained um, um, uh, systems. Um, and that is a technology that is um, more mature than quantum computing. Quantum communications or the quantum internet is this idea of building up a completely secure and impenetrable um, communications infrastructure, which can be land-based as is being done in the Netherlands, but also in the US or potentially satellite based um, uh, as the Chinese have uh, demonstra demonstrated already. And the QKD quantum key development is, is kind of the overall term for anything that uh, relies on uh, quantum uh, mechanical properties to secure communication and, and make it unhackable. Uh, probably the most mature field within quantum technologies uh, in terms of commercial applications, um, every government, every large bank, any kind of organization that sits on sensitive data is currently trialing, piloting um, new QKD protocols uh, to see how uh, to implement them over the next uh, few years. With that, um, if there are no other questions, uh, I uh, thank you for your attention. Wish you all a great rest of the evening or great rest of the day. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you on social media or online.